Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 15. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. We live in a world full of problems and trials and circumstances that we all go through each and every day. We live in a world that has mental instability. We deal with depression. We deal with anxiety. We deal with worry because the purpose that we go through all these things or the reason we go through all these things is because we are disconnecting ourselves from the vine. The only way we're going to be at the point in our life to where we can go through these things the way God intended us going through these things is to be connected to the vine. I'm going to talk to you guys tonight about spiritual disciplines that will develop spiritual maturity in your life. Go ahead and open over to 1 Timothy. If you have your Bibles, if you don't, I'll just read it. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. It says, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of the life that which is to come, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. He says we exercise our bodies, and there, there's some profit to that. There's a little profit from us exercising our bodies, but there's also a spiritual exercise. There's something that we can do spiritually that will strengthen us, that will help us to grow, that will help us to develop to the point to where the, the cares and the worries and the stresses of this life, they don't affect us the same way. That doesn't mean we're not going to go through those things, but how those things affect us changes by us developing these spiritual disciplines in our life. Now, when I'm talking about spiritual disciplines, I'm not talking about something you're doing to earn your salvation. Your salvation is a completed act. You are justified before God as soon as you put your faith in the finished work of Jesus. These are things that we do in our life that help to grow us up, help to mature us and develop us so we can walk out this life being the witness that God has ordained us to be and help us to go through the struggles and the cares of this life that we deal with. And the first one that I want to talk about, well, there's actually there's two categories. First is our private devotion life. And the second category is the local church. I'm going to try to get to both categories. The first one that I want to talk about is Bible intake. Open up your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. I'm going to start reading in verse number 16. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So there's four ways that we intake the Bible into our life that's going to develop us spiritually. Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. Living and active. It's alive. This is not just papers on a page. This is the living Word of God that does something on the inside of us. Mark chapter number 4, verses 26 through 29, it talks about the farmer. He sows the seed in the ground, and he says he goes to sleep night and day, and the seed grows, and it produces fruit of itself. He says the farmer doesn't know how, but it just works naturally. That's the way it is with the Word of God that we put on the inside of us. We start sowing the Word of God. We start sowing the Word of God. We read the Bible. One of the first principles I learned when I became a new believer was the more you put in, the more you're going to get out. So I took that seriously when I first got born again. I would read the Bible, I mean, hours a day. I didn't know what I was reading, but I would just read it and read it and read it. And then I developed this plan that, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start in Genesis, and I'm going to read through Revelation. I'm not going to dictate how much I'm going to read. I'm just going to start reading. When I come to a question, I'm going to take a notebook, and I'm going to write down that question. 
And then I'm going to leave some space below it so I can answer that question as I read the scripture. See, sometimes now we, if we're involved in a local church, we can take those questions to our pastors. We can take those questions to other mature believers. But when you're walking this thing in the beginning, it's good to write those questions down so that way when you do have those encounters with those mature believers, you can ask them those questions. Or you can just keep reading. And that's what I did. I said, you know what, I'm going to write down these questions. And as I read the Bible, what you'll notice is that the more you read it, the more you're going to answer the questions that you had. Because the Bible answers itself. The Bible teaches the Bible. So we not only need to read the Bible, but we need to meditate on the Word. This is one of those things that gets the Word from our mind to our heart. So what I would do is I would sit there and I would read the Scripture, and it would, it would seem like the Holy Spirit would just jump something out to me, like it would come alive on the inside of me. And then whatever that was, I felt that was the Lord speaking to me that passage regarding my day. So what am I going to do? I'm going to meditate on that passage all day long. No matter what I'm going through, whether I'm mowing the grass or whether I'm going to work or whatever it is, I, I just ponder and think over it in my head. Just think over it over and over and over and over. And then it, not comes, it doesn't become just head knowledge. Then it becomes a revelation knowledge that gets on the inside of you. It gets in your heart. And it starts changing your mindset throughout the day. And if we will do this early in the morning to where we have all day long to think about these things, it will have an impact on our attitude throughout the day. I know for myself, if I get up and I just go through the motion, just hit the door running as soon as I wake up, everything that comes against me is difficult to handle. All the struggles, all the worries, all the cares of this day, they're easier to handle when I've spent time with the Lord first. Another one of the spiritual disciplines, we're going to go back to the scriptures, is solitude. We don't want to do this at a place where we're with a bunch of people and I'm going to try to read the Bible and I'm going to try to hear from God. No, we need to be alone with God. We need to unplug our phones. I don't know if you unplug phones anymore, but you need to unplug from your phone, from social media, from answering emails, all those things. Those things are distractions from our quiet time with God. What I'm going to do anytime I have private time with God, I'm going to put my phone to the side. I'm not even going to look at it. I'm not going to check it. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to focus all my attention on the things of God. Now, all these disciplines of, the, of spiritual devotion in our private life, they all kind of go together. We, can't, we do them all at the same time. And the, second thing, the third thing we do is we study the Word of God. So like I said, what I would do in the, in the morning is I would start reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and I'd read however, however much I read. At the end of the day, I would come back to the Bible, and I would just read certain chapters in the New Testament, if that's not where I was, and I would go deeper, and I would start studying, and I would try to find out what words meant. I would try to study a, a word, and I would look throughout the Scripture trying to find what that word meant, and I'm going deeper into the Word, so not only am I answering my previous questions, but I'm getting more of the Word on the inside of us. Because it's living, because it's active, because it's changing me, because it's growing me up, and it's happening from the inside out. So much of the time, we have a, there's a multi-million dollar industry of books on self-help. Everybody's got a book on self-help. You can find 500 different ways to be successful, 500 different ways to improve yourself. The problem is they're starting from the wrong place. We need to start from a place of dependence upon Christ, not dependence upon self. So we, try to, we can put all these principles, and they're great principles, but if we're trying to do it with our own willpower, our own self-determination, all we're going to do is give up. You don't believe me? Just look at the New Year's resolutions, right? We all make these New Year's resolutions at the beginning of the year, but how many of us are still following those New Year's revolutions, re resolutions by the end of the year? Not very many, many of us, because we're trying to rely upon it. We're trying to do it within our own power rather than abiding in Christ, or rather than applying the principles of God and walking them out day by day to where these outward changes only happen from an inward change. Change always happens from the inside. Like when a person's first born again, they are changed from the inside. They've got this new nature. So the old nature and the old ways, we still fall into those things, but it's not our nature to run to those things. It's our nature to run away from those things. It doesn't mean we don't struggle with those things. But the more word of God that we get on the inside of us, the more it starts to change our attitude. It starts to change the way we think. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, it says, Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We change our mind, then we change our life. We change our mind, we change the way we think. We change the way we think, we change our actions. Our everyday actions, everything we do, everything we walk through, it's only going to be changed through the Word of God in our lives. And when we hear the Word of God, when we read the Word of God, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians, it says that you didn't receive the Word as a mere man. You received it as it is in truth, the Word of God. 
So anytime there's teaching that's coming forth, anytime there's scripture that's being read, anytime you're studying on your own, you have to make, have the understanding that that's God speaking to you. The God that created all this, the same God that did all those things in the past is doing those things today. The same God, he wrote this book for us. He wrote this book to, to govern our lives. He wrote this book to lead us towards our relationship with Jesus. But we have to have confidence in this book. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, talking about the children of Israel, it said the same message they heard didn't profit them because they did not mix faith with the message when they heard it. We have to mix faith with the message. We have to mix, mix faith with the word of God. We have to trust our life upon this word. And we have to continually feed it, continually feed it, continually feed it. Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about the, the, the ministry gifts that he gave the body of Christ, 4, 11 through 16. And he says he gave those for the equipping of the saints so that we may grow up. So we may grow up. Anytime the word of God is being taught, we need to be taking notes. We need to, to, to get it on the inside of us. So when I first got born again, I, was, uh, I installed insulation for a living. And I got this revelation that, oh, you need to be listening to teaching all the time. So what I would do is I would put headphones on. I mean, from the time 5.30 a.m. till 5 p.m. when I go home, I got preaching going on in my head all the time. Am I taking it all in? No, but I'm putting it on the inside of me. I said, you know what, if this is the key to growth, if this is the key to change my life, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to start pouring it in, pouring it in. And what I noticed was I started changing. It wasn't automatic. It was gradual. But the more I put in, the more I put in, and the more I applied it to my life, because it doesn't matter what you know if you don't do, right? James 1 tells us to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. So we have to put it into practice, everything that we're reading. And the only way we're going to be able to put it into practice is if we are reading it. If we are studying it, if we are listening to good teachers and the gifting that God has put upon those teachers that opens it up to us, opens it up on how to apply certain principles to our lives. The second one that I want to talk about is prayer. Let's open up to Philippians chapter 4. Sorry, guys, I get a little excited. I only got one mode. Philippians 4. I'm going to start reading in verse number 6. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It goes back to the same thing, guarding our minds, guarding our thoughts, thoughts. And guarding our hearts goes back to our prayer life with God, goes back to the word of God. So much of the time, our prayer life consists of me just in the morning spending five minutes just rehearsing some prayer to God, just telling God what I need. Prayer is more than just us bringing a list before God. Prayer is communing with God. Prayer is getting into a place of intimacy through spending time with him. I heard somebody say years ago, and I believe it to be true, he says, pray until you can pray. Because so much of the time we go in our room, we say, you know what, I'm going to pray. And all, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about the football game. We're thinking about the baseball game. We're thinking about what's going on at work. We're thinking about what happened last week. We're thinking about what we got ahead of us next week. That's why, again, it goes back to the solitude. We get away by ourselves with God, and we start praying. We start out with worship, right? We start out worshiping and praising God. He is a mighty God that deserves our worship. He deserves our praise. And the only way we're going to clear our mind is if we start worshiping him thanking him for who he is, exalting the name of Jesus, exalting the Father for saving us, for healing us, for providing for us, for everything that he's doing in our life. And we just begin to worship and worship and worship. And what we thought we were going to pray for 10 minutes before, next thing you know, we're 15 minutes in, we're still worshiping. We're still worshiping, we're still praising, we're thanking God for what he's doing in our life, and you just keep going. And next thing you know, it feels like a, a burden has lifted from you. It feels like you've, you've stepped into a place to where now, you know what, now I'm really talking to God. I'm not going through the motions anymore. I'm not just saying some words. I am literally talking to God. And he starts changing us on the inside. That doesn't come through our, just our haphazard prayer. Say, God, just do this. Me just reading a page, off a, a page off a book. No, it comes through communing with the Father. It comes through intimacy with God. So much of the time we have prayer as, a, as an intellectual endeavor rather than a relationship. Rather than a developing of intimacy with the Father. And that comes through time. It comes through time. We all don't have hours and hours to pray every day. So what we do is we pray the time we do have. But there is a time where we need to set ourselves away. 
I recommend at least once a week we set ourselves away. Give ourselves an hour. Give ourselves a two hours. And let's just lay in the presence of God. Put all distractions aside. Put on some worship music or classical music or whatever it is that helps you draw into the presence of God. And just pour your heart out to God. Tell him that everything that's going on in your life. Pray that he changes your heart. Pray that he opens doors. Pray that he moves on the inside of you. And if you continually seek the face of God and you continually get in an intimate relationship with him, it begins to change you from the inside. And you're no longer going to want to do the same things you used to do because you're abiding in the vine. We're staying connected with Jesus. We're staying connected with him by this relationship that we're developing by spending time with him. Think about it in your own relationships. I could not have a relationship with my wife if all I did was read a card to her every, every once a week, right? I'm going to spend two minutes. I'm going to read this card to you. Marilyn, I love you. I think you're great. Amen. I can't build a relationship like that, right? It's the same way with our relationship with God. We spend this relationship with God through time. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes love. It takes us pouring out our heart to God. And he reciprocates by you experience that love in your life. The Christian life is an experiential life. It's not about what we know. It's about what we've experienced from God. And he still moves in our lives today. He still moves in our hearts today. But we've got to expect that from him. We've got to do what it takes to enter into a place to where we can receive from God. The Bible says that if you walk in the Spirit, you won't gratify the lusts of the flesh. Walking in the Spirit, there is love, there's peace, there's joy, there's all these things. And the way we walk in the Spirit is by connecting ourselves to the vine. It's by connecting to the Spirit of God through prayer and through our relationship with Him. I want to read a prayer to you that, or a, a quote from John Bunyan. If you don't know who John Bunyan is, he wrote a Christian classic called uh, Pilgrim's Progress. It says, prayer is a sincere, sensible affectionate, pouring out of the heart or soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit. For such things as God has promised or according to the word for the good of the church with submission in faith to the will of God. We pray for the will of God. We pray in the will of God, but we're pouring out our heart to God. There comes a time for us to put our requests before God. I put a request before God a while ago about the healing of Josiah, a member of our church's baby that's struggling with some symptoms right now. We make our requests known to God, but those requests come after us pouring our heart to God, us worshiping him, us exalting who he is, and pouring our heart into him. And I just want to challenge you, take some time away. T take a weekend, take a, an, an hour on a Saturday morning when you're not doing anything else. Shut yourself away. Open up your Bible. Pour out yourself to God and then start reading the Bible. And talk to God while you're reading the Bible. How I many know God still speaks to us today in our heart? We read the scripture. You're having something you don't understand. Ask God, God, what does this mean? I don't understand this. And a lot of the times you will get an answer on the inside of you. But you have to ask. David said in Psalm 119, he said, uh, show me wondrous things in your, in, your, in your word. And that's what we want from God. We want him to open up his word that we can see his glory. We want him to open up his word to where it pushes us and draws us unto him and increases our faith to the level to where nothing hinders us. Because we can trust God as our provider when our faith is built to the level because of focusing on the promises of God. That's how we're going to build our faith to where we can overcome these situations, to where we can accept these situations and know that we're going to come out on the other side, know that God's going to provide, know that God's going to heal, know that God's going to bring me out the other side because I built my faith based on my relationship with God and based on the word of God and the promises of God. Amen? Amen. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to get into the second category right now of the local church of disciplines that we put to practice in order to bring about maturity in our life. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. The next one is fellowship within the body. The reason we have this fellowship at the beginning of the service is so that we can connect with one another, so that we can have this genuine fellowship where we can, where we can sharpen one another, where we can find out what's going in each other's lives, find out what's going on. This brother has an issue. I want to pray for this brother. 
The sister has this need. Hey, let's, let's, let's talk about this need. You, you have questions. Let's answer those questions. It's just a time of building relationships together. God says that we'll show our love by our love one for another. That's how we'll know that we are his disciples. And that's the time that we have at the beginning of the church fellowship. But it doesn't end just here. We take it out into the, into the world. We meet up with people, and we just have these ongoing relationships. How many know these same relationships we have now are we're going to have these same relationships in heaven? Those are the things that's going to last for an eternity, is these relationships that we built, and it encourages us. It stirs us up to good works, and not only that, but it brings a level of accountability. I mean, no, we all need accountability in our lives. We all have these certain things that we want to steer away from. We have these things in our life that become a bondage, that become a burden. But well, when you've got brothers and sisters that you can trust around you, then you can share those with them. They can pray for you. They can help you. They can lead you. They can guide you. Notice I said people that you can trust. You don't want to be telling your problems just to everybody, right? There's always that one person in the church that you tell them your problems and now everybody knows, right? We don't want to talk to those people. We want to have these relationships. How do we know those people? By getting to know one another, by building these relationships, having this fellowship, having these joyous encounters where we exalt the things of Jesus. The Greek word fellowship, it's always based around something. Right? It's, it's the act of sharing around something. Our sharing is around Jesus. Our sharing is around our love for God. And as we commune with one another, as we come and we have these fellowships and these, these relationships that we build, they're going to help us to develop. Next one, uh, Romans chapter 12. The next spiritual discipline we want to put into practice is serving in the local church and outside of the local church. Romans chapter 12, I'm going to read verses 3 through 8. It says, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body... But all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. God has created each and every one of us with certain graces and giftings and abilities that we are designed to use in the local church. We're designed to use them. We are designed to show hospitality. Some people are better at hospitality than other people. My wife is wonderful at hospitality. You come to my house, she's going to have all this food prepared. Everything's laid out for you. If my wife's not involved, you come to my house, I'm going to sit on the couch. I'm like, just come in, go sit down. I don't have that gifting, but she does. And I'm sure there's other people in here that have that same gifting. Sean has a great gifting for teaching. Other people have great giftings in all their exhortation. There's some people that they can encourage you no matter what you're going through. I got a friend by the name of Roy. When I first started preaching, he's got the gift of exhortation, I'm just going to tell you. The first time I preached was at the, the rescue mission in 2006. And the podium was like this, and my legs were shaking like this. And I, I, I had my notes written down, and all I did was read them. I read the notes. Five minutes, all the notes were done. I'm supposed to preach for 45 minutes. I just read them. Five minutes, is done. I got done, and he goes, man, that was great. Oh, that was wonderful. You did such a good job. I said, man, either you're a liar or you got the gift of exhortation, because that was a failure. The only time I looked up was when, when I said the word hell, and I looked up and looked at somebody, made eye contact. I mean, it was awkward and uncomfortable. But the point was he had the gift of exhortation. That doesn't mean that we are perfected our gifts. That means God gives us the gifts and it's our job, it's our duty to perfect them. It's to get better at them. Sean wasn't always a good teacher. He had to perfect that gift. How did he do that? By studying, by, by doing it, by, by being actively doing what he was created to do. And then you start to develop the gifts that he gave you. And we need each other. It says we are one body with many members. And it says we are for one another. I need your giftings. You need my giftings. We need Sean's giftings. We need all, each and every one of us need each other's giftings to build us up into one body. Go back to Ephesians 4. It says the same thing. We're building ourselves up. We're building each other up. And that's coming through the local church. That's coming through actively serving in the local church. And I don't want to limit our serving just to the local church. I mean, no, there's a lost and dying world out there. We serve the Lord through us being a witness, us going out and reaching the lost. 
That is us serving the Lord. We serve the Lord through like, like Sean does on Friday nights at the, at the rescue mission, going down there and just hanging out with kids, hanging out with these families that don't have anybody to hang out with. He's going down there and he's hanging out with these families. That's what we're called to do. We are called to love one another. We are called to love others. And we are called to take these giftings that God has given us and to go out in this world and make a difference. I don't know about you, but I don't want to die. I don't want to live my life and finish my race and say, what did I accomplish? What did I do? When I'm dead, I don't want people sitting at my funeral. Well, he never really did anything. He kind of just sat in his room, didn't care about anybody, didn't talk to anybody. Kind of a miserable person, actually. I don't want that to be said about me. I want to be, I want to be said about me that he was a loving person. That you know what? I don't know a lot about Chris, but I know that he loved me. I don't know a lot about Chris, but I know that he was faithful. I don't know a lot about Chris, but I know that he would take the shirt off his back for anybody. That's what I want to be said about me. And that's what I want to be said about you. So much of the time we walk through this world with our head in a cloud and we're not paying attention to anybody that's around us. I want, to be a, I want to be aware of my surroundings. I want to be aware of the person that's on the corner that they're weeping, that I can go up and pray for that person. We are so self-aware that we are no earthly good. We need to be aware of the people around us, and we need to ask God, God, put people in my path that I can help. Put people in my path that need you. Put people in my path that are going through problems that I can pray for, that I can help. I mean, no, it's, 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 it's okay to pray for a problem, but if I can help that problem, I want to help that problem also. If they have a financial need and I have the finances to give to that need, I want to be able to do that. The last one we're going to talk about, everybody says, amen, thank you, is giving financially. Open up to Galatians chapter 6. Sean will be back next week, guys. Don't worry. Sean will be back next week. Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 6 through 7. It says, Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. I'm not taking an offering right now. Don't worry. It is our privilege to give in to the kingdom of God. How many know electricity isn't free? Taking the gospel around the world isn't free. Churches have needs. Churches have things that they want to buy. We want, we want all these things for our church so that we can be a light, so that we can be a beacon of hope for around the world. And it takes finances to do that. And God says, I'm giving you the opportunity to sow into the kingdom. I'm giving you an opportunity to give of your resources. Giving is one thing that is a good indicator of our heart, right? If we're not willing to give, if we're not willing to give God what he has given us, that is showing that we're not trusting him to provide for us. It just shows our unbelief, our unbelief that God is going to actually do what he says he's going to do. If the Bible says that those, if you sow, you're going to reap, I want to be the one that's sowing, not for reaping. I want to be one that's sowing to make a difference. I want to be giving to the point to where the gospel is being proclaimed around this world and lives are being transformed, people are being saved, and it was all helped by the giving that I gave. Right? And that's part of us as a local church. Local churches can't survive without the giving of the congregations. That's why God commanded it. The Bible says that he who, lives, who preaches the gospel should live of the gospel. Because he knows that it needs to be funded in order to be there. And you know, the buildings aren't free. Lands aren't free. All these different things aren't free. So we have to give in to those things so that they can be there for the next generation. So much of the time, we're, so, we're only worried about us, right? We're only worried about here and right now. I know I'm giving for the future. I'm giving for the next generation. I want to leave something. I want to leave a legacy for my children. I want this church to be here in 10 years. I want this church to be here in 15 years. And that comes through our giving. That comes through our serving. That comes through our fellowship. And that comes through our spiritual devotion to the Lord. I mean, I'm going to invite Pastor Sean up here.